Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy that it's Friday, and I hope that you are having some great weekend plans. I actually do have weekend plans. Tonight, I am headed into Missoula, which is where the airport that I fly out of is located, and my niece, my 18-year-old niece is going with me. We're going to spend the night, and then she's going to take me to the airport bright and early in the morning. I'm actually going back to California after 14 and a half weeks in Montana. I added it up, and I traveled over 5,000 miles in the car. That's not counting the flight here while I was home this summer and uh, 4,000 plus of those miles I drove. So it was definitely an experience and I'm really, as I've said before, very glad that I got to be here for that. But looking forward to going home and seeing my husband and my puppies and my dragons and just seeing, I'm not looking forward to going from fall in Montana to summer in California, but it should start cooling down a little bit. Uh, in the next couple of weeks so it'll be in the 90s when I get home and then hopefully cooling down so that's that's what I have going on this weekend hope you have something of interest that is going on in your weekend in your life as well let's talk about books um as I mentioned at the end of the last episode I am speaking today with author Kathleen Shoup about her new historical fiction novel The Magician When I spoke with Kathleen, I said it was a series, and she corrected me to say it's a collection, which is correct. Uh, It really is more of a collection than uh, a series as we would think of it, and so she'll explain more about that. But let me give you the description of the book itself. Again, it's called The Magician. It's by Kathleen Choup. Uh, It says, Denora, 2019. 92-year-old Patrick Rusick is on the run, bath towel flying off with nothing but his new Nikes to carry him to freedom. His plan to escape from the Blue Horizon... Excuse me, Blue Horizon... Ah, geez. His plan to escape from Blue Horizon retirement community is in motion, except his great-grandson Owen isn't at the pickup point. Resigned to his fate, Patrick returns to his room and reads from his incredible hand-drawn chronicle of Denora, luring half the nursing home's employees and residents into the room, mesmerizing them with tales of Stan F. Musial, beloved baseball Hall of Famer. Denora, 1920. Mary Musial is expecting again. After four daughters, her husband Lucas is hoping is losing hope for a son. But Jupiter is rising when Stanislaw Franischek Musial is born on November 21st, 1920, and the midwife predicts he will live an extraordinary life. Young Stanley's physical talents show themselves at the Polish Falcons and on the baseball field. But rather than pride, Lucas's spirits plummet after mill injuries turn his American dream into a living nightmare. When the depression hits and the mills close, tension grips every Denora household. Meanwhile, as Stan matures, he draws attention from the press, college coaches, and professional baseball scouts. Suddenly, his singular dream is set against options he'd never imagined. Every choice threatens to disappoint coaches, teachers, his girlfriend, and most of all, his parents. Even with the talent to achieve his goals, doubt creeps in. Can he find the courage to leave everything he knows and all the people he loves to fulfill his destiny? Or will he wait too long and risk it all? So again, that is the description of The Magician, and I love that it starts with 92-year-old Patrick 
and his escape attempt because that was just, I mean, it just jumps right into the action. He is running. He escaped during shower time, so he's got his Nikes on and his towel, and at one point he has to abandon the towel. So he's just a 92-year-old stark naked man in a pair of Nikes running away from the nursing home, and it's actually... It's very bittersweet because it's it's funny, but it's also not funny, as you can imagine. But it, it's a really great opening scene and, and draws you in. And then, then you're sucked into Patrick's story of Stan and Stan's family. And I didn't even know much about anything. I'm, I'm not even going to say much. I didn't know anything about Stan Musial when I started reading this book. I don't follow baseball a lot, and I don't know a lot about um the history of baseball, but I do love historical fiction, as you know, so I really enjoyed reading and getting to know this character, albeit in um, a fictionalized way, but getting to know a little bit more about this character who would become um, a a beloved and and very well-known baseball player, so enjoyed that immensely. Let's go ahead and turn to the interview with Kathleen so she can tell you more about the story and why she decided to write about this particular character and why she is writing this collection set in Denora. Again, the book is called The Magician. The author is Kathleen Shoup. Hi, Kathleen. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate being here. Thank you for joining me. I'm excited to talk about your new book, The Magician. Before we get to the book, though, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, I live in the Pittsburgh area in Oakmont. Pennsylvania. And um, my background is I have a PhD in reading research and instruction and all things literacy related, um, including writing, of course. Um, And so I've been an educator for a large part of my life. Um, I'm also an author slash storyteller, which is my focus now. And of course, a mom and wife and all those things that everybody is. (laughs) All right, thank you. So the book is the third book in a series, and it's the the Denora. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes, okay, and it's the- more of a collection than a series um, because it's the town that ties all the pieces together. Now, it just so happens that book two and three, there are some character ties, but I want it to be free to skip around and not necessarily have it go in a series order the way people expect when they hear the word series. So I, I try to call it more of a collection. Okay. Um, so can you talk about what you got, what got you started on this collection? What was your inspiration for it? Sure. Um, I was looking for a second novel idea, and I like the idea of having some sort of real life event that turns the plot and also, you know, forces character development, things like that. And uh, my mother, who's actually from the West Coast, said, why don't you do the um, Denora killing smog of 1948? And Denora is a town about an hour from Pittsburgh. Um, And I said, I don't have any idea what that is. And I kind of just ignored that for a little while. And then when I looked it up, I said, oh, that is a fantastic uh, novel idea, inspiration for a novel. And what that killing smog was, was in 1948, um, the mills, which are located along the shores of this horseshoe bend in the land and um, in Denora, um, the mills were spewing a lot of waste, of course, steel mills. And um, there was a temperature inversion that kind of locked all those fumes in and then um, killed immediately 20 people, sickened about 6,000. And then over the next few months, um, many more people died. And it's actually referenced in The Crown, the series on Netflix. Is it on Netflix or Amazon Prime? Um, I am. Because. They had the same type of temperature inversion combined with their mill smoke, which killed a lot more people than the Denora smog. But they referenced the Denora smog in that. So that first book of this collection, After the Fog, um, centers around the timeline of that killing smog. And then the family is fictional, but again, the um, event is factual, um, but fictionalized. And then from there, 
I just grew so interested in the town and the people, the historians there were so helpful. And, you know, just through hours and hours of conversation with townspeople and historians, I um, started to think of other interesting people to explore in the town. So I came um, to the idea of finally wanting to write about Stan Musial, who's a Hall of Fame baseball player. But the more I researched him, the more interested I became in his parents, how they met, um, and how they ended up together. And it's an immigrant tale. And I just thought to myself, well, that deserves its own book. So I wrote that book. And then I got to The Magician. That book's called The Strong Man and the Mermaid. And then the third book called The Magician is about Stan Musial and his um, his childhood. It's not about him, the baseball player, the grown-up. It takes us through even young adulthood, through him getting married. But he got married very young. He was just 19. So to me, that's still his childhood. <laughs> but he was married. So, um, But that's how the collection came about. And then... Uh, um, the next two stories are not tied to the mutuals at all. Interesting. Thank you so much for that. Um, so this this book is The Magician. It is the one about Stan. So um, what about him really made you want to write more of his story, especially his childhood story? Well, part of the part of the reason I focused on the childhood, although there were times when I was writing that I questioned whether I was writing the right story. Like, should I be writing about when he was already a um, accomplished baseball player? And then I thought, there's so many biographies about him and articles and things like that, and they're mainly focused on his accomplishments, his already. Um, when he was facile as a baseball player, when he was famous. Um, And I really was intrigued by his childhood. And he grew up in the Depression. And at the time, Denora was especially hard hit, the town, um, because they weren't making much steel. And the 12,000 people who lived there, um, there were... I think there was one year, like 1932 or 33, where only like 100 people were working at a time, and they would let the men kind of filter through the mill, taking turns with shifts and things like that. But it was just an astonishing time to me to look back on and see how people lived, and in that environment, how somebody like Stan Mutual, who was A, supernaturally talented, but also extremely hardworking and humble and open to being mentored and taking advice, how somebody like that comes out of basically nothing in terms of how we look at, um, you know, uh, owning things or the standard of living today. I mean, everybody was poor back then compared to now. Um, And then, you know, put the depression on it and people really struggled. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you, you know, just the just the joy of the the scenes where the kids are are playing baseball, even though they're playing baseball with um, pickets from fences or you know homemade balls or whatever they could scrounge. Still, the joy shines through in those scenes. Well, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about Patrick and that infamous, I guess, maybe first scene of the novel. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC book review podcast, and I will be right back. GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Kathleen Shoup about her historical fiction novel, The Magician. And I realize that I'm giggling. Well, I'm I'm giggling about the next question, but I'm also giggling about me giggling about the next question because I referenced that first scene and I say I don't want to give anything away. But I totally gave it away when I read the back of the book at the beginning of the interview. So... Spoilers, whatever, I don't know. Anyway, let's return to the interview with Kathleen. Yeah. Um, the, the book has one of the best opening scenes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I don't want to give it away. But uh, okay. it does involve Patrick. And can we talk a little bit about Patrick? And why did you, um, why did you choose to tell the story of I mean, it's from Mary and Stan's points of view for most of it, but then there's also Patrick who tells parts of the story as well. Well, that started with book two when I decided I didn't originally set out to write a collection of these books. I just was going to write After the Fog and then be done with it. But there was just so much material that I decided I wanted to do more. And when I started doing the research and looking back, there really, to me, is an element of um, magic being not the right word, but the best one for, I think, the way sort of fate and destiny interferes or contributes to, you know, a person who grows up very poor in um, Poland, who takes the ship across the Atlantic and ends up in Denora to meet the the woman he marries, and then they have this child um, who is just so exceptional in every way. Um, I don't know. There's an element of just kind of like a fairy tale to it, and it doesn't mean it's an easy life or anything, but these people were just so fascinating, um, the, the people who chose to leave their countries for something better, and then when they got here, it wasn't always what they expected, even though lots of times it was better than what they what they left. But um, I was just fascinated with that and then um, thought that, that out of that kind of fairy tale feel that I needed a narrator. And so Patrick was sort of born out of that and I figured he'd have a book in an attic and <laughs> That that's in Strongman and the Mermaid, and that's how it would start, where he's telling me stories, and then I'm gonna thread him through the 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 four books after after the fog. So he's in one and two, or two and three, and then he'll be in four and five. And yes, you'll learn more about his story as we go, um, and as you people already have from one to or from two to three. So yeah, you'll learn more about him. But I really needed something in my eyes. Although it's not a series, I guess he's the character who is threaded throughout, even though it's the smallest part of the the whole book. Um, you know, he's kind of the thread that ties everything together with the town. He's sort of like the voice of the town of Denora, I guess. Yeah, I think they refer to him at one point as the unofficial historian of Denora. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, as I mentioned but most of the story is told from Mary's point of view and Stan's point of view. Can you talk a little bit about what you think about these two will resonate with readers? Yeah. With Mary, she's the mom who has dreams for her children, but also sees who's good at what, and then tries to support them in achieving those dreams. And of course, the time in which this story takes place, um, women don't have as much overt agency, but she is um, extremely strong and she's good at managing her husband to make sure that the house stays as peaceful as possible and that her children get what they need um, no matter what Lukash is up to or not, her husband. Um, so um, I think that resonates oddly, even though it was, you know, when the story opens, it's a hundred years earlier than now, but I think, you know, we've read so much about and many women can attest to the fact they still are responsible for 
most of the household stuff, the kids stuff, and then whatever job um, they can pick up to to have extra money or just contribute all the money, depending. Um, and I think that resonates still today, unfortunately, but she was a strong, creative person who um, really, Stan was the apple of her eye from everything I could tell, and he just adored her. And then his point of view, I think, you know, starting with him as a child, um, he, he recognizes his talents, and they give him self-confidence, and he loves and enjoys having these talents, but it also, he understands how it's starting to set him apart from his brother, from his family. Um, it's giving him opportunities and also separating him from the people he loves and is used to. And he was a very shy guy who, um, you know, he didn't grow up learning business manners and things like that, but he was always open to listening to male mentors who would um, teach him how the world worked beyond just playing baseball, beyond Zenora, and beyond his working class upbringing. So um, everybody was always willing to help him, but he was always humbly willing to take the help. And I guess that combo I read a lot about is what um, people just loved about him. Yeah, he really is um, an engaging character even from the start. So I I think Mary as a character can sometimes be a little hard because, you know, we as women want more for her. We don't want her to have to be in this relationship. And, and <laughs> But that's not really up to us. <laughs> Especially yes, as a, exactly. I know. <laughs> um so what you, you mentioned that you uh, that sounds like you do a lot of research. What types of research did you do for this book? I imagine it there was a lot. Yeah, there's definitely different research paths and and <clears throat> levels of research. Um, I definitely try to do as many interviews with historians and people from Denora as possible to get background on the town as well as. Um, on you know whatever I could about Stan that people were willing to share. Um, then I did a lot of research on you know these Pittsburgh and I know Denora is not Pittsburgh, but again it's in the vicinity and in some ways we're all Pittsburghers even if your town is Denora. Um, we maintain those separate immigrant groups even you know as as people were assimilating. They were also still gathering at their churches and, um, you know, uh, celebrating heritage in a certain way. Um, so there's a lot of, I found a lot of information about Polish immigrants, specifically in Polish male immigrants and how they worked into society in America. And Stan's father was from Poland and that played an important part. You know, as I read, biographies about him and then his autobiography there were snippets about the family you know a line here a comment there like the one part about the um, condensed milk things like that that I built scenes around to show all different aspects of the the family dynamics and the neighborhood dynamics um, that was just a line from his autobiography about how he used to sneak the condensed milk and his sisters were supposed to keep him from doing it. Um, and I just, I kept coming across little lines like that that then sent me down research paths, like I said, with the um, the immigrant men from Poland. Um, I found an interesting tidbit that for them, their strength, their physical strength was so much a part of who they were and their identity and what they did well that they were less inclined to take jobs as a tailor or a chef or something like that because they didn't view that as work they should be doing. So there were all these different paths of research I was gathering and then trying to build these people from the autobiography and biographies to make them true to life, but again, fictionalized. So um, it was tricky, but I learned a lot, put it that way. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I can imagine it. I, I would think it would be difficult to stop doing research because there there would be so much. Yeah. In terms of it being historical fiction, um, character development is a little, I, I, I would imagine, a little different than when you're writing fiction. Um, what types of character development do you like to do before and during the writing process? Well, I probably in this case where some of them were characters were inspired by actual people, um, I would definitely take the framework that I discovered through research about what these people were like. And like Stan, the consensus was he was just this generous, kind, sweet person his whole entire life, but he was shy and awkward with adults, things like that. So what I did was try to take those things and dial them back through a childhood and imagine what that might look like as it played out with him with his friends versus him with teachers um, where he partly developed a stutter through being forced to write with his right hand, stuff like that. So I tried to take what was reported about him as factual and then see how that would play out in him, in scenes, throughout his life. Um, and I, like I said, I, I was very careful to really try to um, do that in a respectful way that hopefully conveys a sense of truth, even if not every single thing is factual, because I can't know every factual, everything that came out of his mouth, you know. <laughs> right. There's no way. Nobody followed him around with a recorder. Uh, right. <laughs> Definitely not as a child. Um, yeah, so a lot of back and forth and shaping and um, refining. Time now for our second break of the podcast. When we return, Kathleen will be talking about any autobiographical elements that she includes in her writing. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. In this episode, I am speaking with author Kathleen Shoup about her historical fiction novel. It's called The Magician. It is about Denora, Pennsylvania, and the life of Stan Musial, the baseball player. So let's go ahead and return now to that interview. Do you include autobiographical elements in your writing? Again, I know this is probably a little different because this is historical fiction, but overall, do you tend to include autobiographical elements? To some degree, like, okay, growing up where I did, um, outside of Pittsburgh, um, of course, much later than him, but, and also as a female, it's different, but I have brothers who played baseball, I played softball, um, our, all of the towns when I was growing up, they were very similar in terms of them having identities and sports being a big deal and things like that, so I <laughs> like the... The fight that I have Stan and his brother have on the baseball field, that was drawn from actually um, one of my brother's baseball teams where a set of brothers, they're just a year apart in age, and very talented baseball players got into a fist fight right on the field. Um, 
you know, and then two seconds later, they were best friends again, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I draw on aspects, like, it just worked out where, you know, Stan's brother, Honey, always, he was also very talented, but not, just not quite as talented as Stan. So, you know, I, I could imagine from seeing families I knew, how they operated, that, you know, how these things might play out in Stan's life as well. Yeah, absolutely. What about the genre of historical fiction do you think draws you to writing within that genre? Well, you know, they say all the stories have already been told and things like that, and that's absolutely true. And for me, one of the ways that a story can be fresh is actually going back in time because either we've forgotten certain eras and what they were really like, or we never really knew. As individuals, we didn't know. Um, A lot of television has sanitized the way we look back at certain eras. And, um, you know, a lot of pop culture, things like that. We have very distinct views of things being better the way they were or cleaner or nicer, all these things that really aren't true. Um, And so stories like this give an opportunity, like the whole coming of age and following your dream theme for Stan is made new for people who A, don't know about him, or B, don't know about how the world worked at that time. So even though... I'm retelling the same stories everyone's been telling since the beginning of time. I think it gives, it's fun to actually make it new by going back. Yeah, and just the little things that we might not even think about, you know, having indoor plumbing, having electricity, digging coal out of a seam in the backyard to heat the house, those <laughs> things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are you working on now, if you can talk about it? Sure. Um, I'm working on a couple things. Right now, in the immediate time, I am finishing up some Christmas and holiday stories. I, I do a couple of those every year, at least one, like, novella, and then some stories. And so I'm getting those finished up to um, have them come out for the holidays. But then longer term, I'm working on um, book four, and that's the Nora collection, um, and that's called The Circus Dancer, and part of it is in Russia, and part of it, a lot of it, most of it's in Denora. So I am working on that right now. And then I have a fifth book in that letter series, which is the first, well, again, that one wasn't intended to be a series either, but then people wanted to know more. So um, I'm book five of that series. Uh, And the letters series, um, if I'm remembering right, is is that based on letters that you actually found from ancestors, or am I thinking? Yeah, my mother was given these letters from her parents, her her dad, and then um, his her dad's um, father kept them, um, and they were written. um, Well, we have probably close to 300 letters, and most of them are written later in the family's life, but the the first set of 50 are written in the year of the couple's engagement, my great-great-grandparents' engagement, and that's sort of what kicked off the whole series. But again, I was only intending to write the last letter, um, which is fictionalized, um, but also based on this these threads of truth about the family and... Um, and then people just wanted to know more, so I ended up writing more, and it's that's a tricky series because that is so far set up more like a series, but because I didn't start it that way, I'm not sure I'm doing a really good job. Like when people, ex- they expect certain things with a series to flow, and because I didn't intend it that way, it, there's not always the right flow, I think. So I like every single individual book, um, and I think I think most readers do, but you never know with historical fiction. People seem to love or hate what you do with it. <laughs> there's not there's not much middle road. Well, I would imagine it would be difficult also because you fictionalized the story from the letters, and now it's a series, and so you're continuing these stories. But 
I would imagine it's branching off from family history and kind of going in its own oh, direction. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, totally. And one of the things that helped me figure out how to do that was I went to, this was years ago, my daughter and I went to see Wicked and um, the play and we were watching it. And at the end where, you know, the Wicked Witch, it turns out has this whole entire backstory and existence that you never know as, you know, if you just know the Wizard of Oz. And then it occurred to me, I'm like, oh, that's how I could do it. That's how I could, you know, the the reader sees one thing in the first book, but that doesn't mean that's the whole story. Um, so then I was like, okay, I can do this. So then I started writing these other ones. And that is satisfying to me to give these um, slices of lives that are hidden in one book or another. But not every reader likes that. Some readers really like to see that everything flows from the first book. Like the reason character A is hateful in book one needs to be explained, you know, in a certain way versus me taking that wicked view where I'm like, no, I'm just going to tell this person's story and this is the way they were. You just didn't know that in book one. <laughs> so it's it's kind of tricky, but it's fun. It's all good. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you mentioned that you work a lot with um, with literacy, reading, writing, et cetera. So uh, I would imagine that you've written a lot during your lifetime. Um, but when did you decide to start writing potentially for publication? That was probably um, that's probably like twenty three or four years ago, um, where I just started telling these stories. I was always a huge reader. Stories played a huge role in my life, both oral stories, like relatives of mine were just fantastic storytellers, and then, of course, what I was reading. Um, and there were elements of storytelling, like I would keep lists of things. Um, there were always stories going on in my mind as a kid, all the way up until when I started to try to write, and that might it might have even been closer to 30 years. But... <laughs> I didn't really start trying to sell things or publish things until probably 2005-ish, around then, I believe, um, maybe a little earlier. So um, I did finally just say to myself, all right, I'm going to try and write something that I've been thinking about, and then I just did. Yep, at some point you just have to say, why not? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in the doing. I mean, that's the thing. It's all in the rewriting. It's all in the, um, at first, I think the volume, people worry a lot about how perfect something is when they're writing it. And I didn't worry about that. I just wrote and wrote and wrote and got tons and tons of feedback. I was very open to hearing what didn't work. I loved hearing what did work. That was nice. But, um, you know, um I think it was just the volume I wrote and then the feedback, the, the fact that I was always looking for what people were seeing and what I was doing so then I could shape it the way I actually wanted it to be. And so out of that experience is kind of what you just described, would that be the basis for what you might give as advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, I do do a lot of workshops the conferences and coaching, things like that. And that's always a big part of it. You know, people come at different points in their writing. So, um, but for anyone starting out who just wants to, who wants to be a writer, um, well, I would say definitely just volume, write a ton and worry about story over anything else. And then if you want to write short stuff and get that published, that's good. Because it does feel good to finish things. Um, but I, I think just being, you got to be open to hearing what's wrong up until a certain point in publication. Then you have to shut off the criticism. But um, to me, I think that's one of my biggest strengths is that um, I've built a group of people who I know can see what my goals are for something, but then tell me how I'm not meeting those goals. And it took me a while to find that. At first, I would swing back just like a pendulum 
one person would be like, oh, no, you should be doing this, and I would change a whole entire draft of a book. And then someone else would be like, oh, no, no, that shouldn't be like that. Do it this way. And then I'd rewrite the whole thing. And it took me a while to figure out, I need someone who is going to read knowing what I want it to be and help me make it that, not because you could change it forever to match what someone else wants. Oh, exactly. Yeah, you can never please everybody. Hmm. In fact, I will probably not please some people when I say it's time for the third break of the podcast, because, you know, not everybody likes breaks. But it is that time. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Kathleen Shoup. When you take the time to read for yourself, do you have, I assume you have favorite genres and authors or books that you tend to go back to? Well, I always read a lot of nonfiction. And then, yeah, fiction, I love Kate Morton and Fiona Davis and Eileen Hodgett and Wright. Abigail Drake, um, Victoria Christopher Murphy, Murray, and Marie Benedict. And I read a lot of, believe it or not, middle grade books. Um, I love those because, to me, in a lot of ways, they're just like pure storytelling that can have elements of a fantasy, not, not in the way of a genre of fantasy necessarily. But there's just... They're just telling the story. Now, when you get a little higher up a few grades, they're trying to catch the eye of, you know, teenagers with flashy things. And I just I just love that middle grade novel um, genre for just pure, beautiful storytelling. So I love, um, you know, D. Camillo and Appelt and Applegate. I read all those things. And um, Lisa Klein Ransom. And Patricia Palacco, who is a picture book author, but every single book she writes is just loaded with fantastic content. And it's usually, you know, family stuff. Um, A lot of it's historical. Mm -hmm. But I I love those. They're they're just so well done. All those all those authors do such a beautiful job. Yeah. You mentioned Abigail Drake, and I know she's also a Pennsylvania-based writer. Are are any of the other um, authors on your list Pennsylvania-based? Yeah, Eileen Hodges Enright is, although she's originally from the UK. And actually one of her, she was a playwright and an author, and one of her plays about the Titanic is actually currently being made into a movie, and it got stalled a little bit with um, coronavirus, but... Um, yeah, that's pretty exciting to see her work. I think, I think the original play is 20 years old or something. And then to see it be made into a movie now, it's really fascinating. But she has a novel on the Titanic now. I mean, that's a, that's a great genre to write in. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, I know you have a website, so if you can direct people to your website, but also where you, um, what social media platforms you're on as well. Yeah, ksoup.com is my website. And um, probably the places I'm most active, though, are Instagram and Facebook and, um, believe it or not, TikTok. I do go on Twitter a lot, but it's more newsy for me at this point. Um, And... So I think Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook are probably where I'm most 
active for anybody looking. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have talked about um, a bunch of different stuff today, but is there anything that you had hoped to highlight during our time together that we haven't covered? Um, it's not so much highlight. It's just something I always think about when I write my stories because some people so beautifully write exactly what readers want. And I feel like for me, um, you know, one of the things I need are people to be willing to immerse in a pretty long book that, you know, um, they're a little, I think there's a lot of plot in them for sure, but requires a little, I guess, appreciation for grit and less stylized romance. Like when when I first put out The Magician, some um, marketers and things like that really focused on the 20s, because it starts in the 20s in that whole flapper, glamorous kind of era. And I was like, that isn't, that isn't what these people are exploring, though. <laughs> They're not flappers. <laughs> you know, it's it's a grittier... My books seem to be this grittier examination of the human condition, which to me is fascinating, but I understand it's not always what people are looking for in their fiction. It's not really escapism, but you do learn a lot, and I think the characters potentially stick with people. I mean, I've heard that a lot, put it that way. Yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, as a fan of historical fiction myself, I, you know, I appreciate that it's everyday people living their lives. You know, it doesn't have to be glamorous all the time. Yeah, because it, yeah. Not, my life certainly isn't glamorous. <laughs> so I understand that. <laughs> no, I know. And I do understand the need to escape too. But um, I don't know, like everything I pick up, some of them are glamorous tellings of a certain era, but I really do love the grittier books. And hopefully then I find those same readers who love my version of that. Mm, absolutely. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, not only about The Magician, but also the Donora Collection and a little bit about um, the Letters series. I really, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. I appreciate you asking me on and having the chance to um, explore a little bit about my work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you once again, as always, to Kathleen for joining me for this interview, uh, not only about The Magician, but also about some of her other writings and also her this collection, the Donora collection. I do want to go back and read the other two books that are already in the collection and then find out more about Donora, especially the... Um, the incident that Kathleen talked about at the beginning with the um, the the air inversion and that, that that just sounds crazy. Anyway, I grew up in an area that got some crazy air inversions, but never anything like that that I'm aware of. And also, I was telling my mom about this series, and she looked it up, and it is actually included on her Kindle Unlimited. So if you like uh, historical fiction and you want to check out this series and you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read it right away on that and it's included in your Kindle Unlimited price, I guess I would say. Um, so yeah, there's that option or of course there's always ordering the actual physical book. There's checking it out from your library. So many fun ways to read or listen to or get books into your life and just explore and find out the best way that works for you. So thank you once again to Kathleen. Thank you to you, my listeners, as always, very much appreciate you. And I hope that as always, if you're a fan of this podcast and you have not done so already, you could take a few minutes to leave a review, whether that is starred or written. Either way helps to get this podcast out to more people who love books, and it would really, really, really make my day if you were to leave a review. I would appreciate that so much. Also, you can follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I, I actually, um, speaking of social media, after this interview, I did go and follow Kathleen on TikTok. So if you're on TikTok, you should do that. I'm trying to work on a TikTok account for this podcast. I know I said that before, but putting my face on the TikTok, I don't know. Anyway, look for that. It'll come, it'll come eventually. <laughs> so I hope that you, you know, you check out this book, that you check out 
the the podcasts, social media, Kathleen's social media, all of that wonderful stuff. And I hope that you will join me next time. I'll be back in California, although the interview will have been recorded in Montana, so it will be a, a dual state <laughs> interview. But I will be speaking with Sadie Hoagland about her debut novel called Strange Children. It is about, it is told from the points of view of eight different children who grow up in a polygamist community in um, in Utah. And so it's it's really, really interesting, very poignant, very, I don't know, we'll have to talk about that more. But definitely join me for that conversation on the next episode. In the meanwhile, I hope that you're having a wonderful Friday. I hope that you have plans for the weekend. And I definitely hope that you have plans that involve getting lost in a good book. My hope is that I will be lost in a good book through two flights and a layover in Salt Lake City. So that's my hope. But I hope that you have lots of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Movie to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program